Our next speaker coming up is... Oh, I haven't practiced this and I haven't discussed it with him. You can say Diego Aranha, that's oh, fine. Don't, don't tell me. Don't tell me. Di Diego, Diego Aranha. Like lasagna. lasagna. Aranha? I don't even have that on it. Aranha like lasagna, the pronunciation. Lasagna? Yeah, pronounced the same. Okay, but it's spelled Aranha. Long story, long story. <laughs> okay, with a, with a silent S. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Diego uh, from Department of Engineering, Aarhus uh, University. Can blockchain make voting more secure? Let's hear about that. Give him a hand. Thank you. So my, my main research is in cryptographic engineering, which means developing techniques to deploy cryptography uh, securely in practice. But I have this uh, weird research topic and, and uh, disturbing hobby of studying elections or electronic elections in particular. And today I will try to uh, give information to solve or, or to answer this question. Can blockchains make voting more secure? And by voting here, I mean uh, races for public positions, so official elections conducted by governments. Of course, private companies and other enterprises can, can choose different ways to vote because they have different threat models, right? So let's start with the basics of election security. Um, all elections, to be fair and reasonable, they, they need to satisfy some requirements, some security properties. Uh, and some of these are fairly intuitive to us. Uh, first of all, only eligible voters should be able to vote. You don't want to, to allow people who are not allowed to vote to cast uh, their choices. Votes should be secret, so, we, so voters can freely express their will towards their candidates, no matter, their, no matter how horrible that can, those candidates can be. Uh, votes shouldn't be changed after the fact, so there is an integrity property also that's important. And all of this is just to uh, basically convince the losers that they actually lost. This, this is the ultimate goal of elections, to convince the losers that they lost so that the election is uh, legitimate. This is fairly easy. It's fairly easy to see how this is accomplished by a paper ballot election. Uh, basically, ballot secrecy is guaranteed by a voting booth, so you can uh, pick your choices on the ballot without anyone seeing. Uh, the integrity uh, property is basically everyone looking at the ballot box for the whole day to see that no one is messing with the contents. Um, and eligible, eligibility can be solved by just government-issued documents. Uh, but humans, you know, they, they have this tendency of automating everything. Uh, and the effort of automating elections started in the 1920s with the first lever machines. These are basically giant contraptions to help, uh, in some way, a voter to cast their ballots. They were introduced in the US uh, at first. And they were used for decades. Uh, I don't know exactly from looking at the picture how this could help someone to vote, but not get into that. And for decades, um, these were the main uh, voting interfaces for, for uh, several states in the US. With the dawn of the electronic age, of course, the effort continued to uh, the development of electronic voting machines, especially at the end of the uh, 90s and beginning of the 2000s. And in the US in particular, a huge push towards that was the election of Bush. You probably remember the situation in Flor Florida with the recounts and the Supreme Court mandating recounts to be stopped and, and all of that. So, Several countries have adopted electronic voting machines uh, in the end of the, nine, uh, the dawn of the new century and the end of the 90s already. I have pictures there from uh, the clock, uh, countrywise order from India, the Netherlands, uh, the US, and Brazil. Um, and I have to admit that these machines helped voters vote in some ways. In, in several cases, they, made, uh, they provide better interfaces than in the paper ballot for poor voters or, or voters with uh, dealing with accessibility uh, problems. But from the point of view of security, this, I have to say these machines were a huge step back. So if you take a look at the analysis, the security analysis of how these machines operate, how the software is written, how the security measures are implemented, they are a textbook of what not to do. So it's a great, actually they are great textbooks for anyone willing to learn how to protect compu computer systems because you get all the counterexamples from, from uh, those security analysis. Uh, I've participated in two different hacking challenges of the Brazilian voting system, where we could find ways for external attackers to break both, both ballot secrecy using only public information, and also to manipulate the software installed in the machines so it would manipulate the count. Um, so I still have nightmares about this after all these years. So if voting machines do not 
help or do not solve the problem after all. Maybe we should look for alternatives. And some countries have done by thinking of deploying internet voting, which in my opinion makes everything worse due to just a, a larger attack surface in which now, um, first of all, other countries can participate in your elections, not in the nicest way possible, but they surely can, either by preventing elections to be held with denial of service attacks or just hacking infrastructure and, and casting votes. Uh, but there are other um, not as scary uh, uh, ways of manipulating elections conducted through the internet. Now it's much harder to protect voters from coercion because they are voting remotely. How can you prevent an employer from collecting everyone for the big voting day so everyone needs to, to vote on a certain, following certain instructions? Um, you also need to worry about malware installed in the computers uh, belonging to the voters so they, these computers do not cast votes in place of the voters. You now have to worry about insiders because these usually are centralized systems. So you need to worry about insiders operating the system and maybe manipulating uh, how votes are being counted. Uh, no matter all these risks, uh, at least one country got this mostly functioning. This is Estonia. So in Estonia, you have the option to vote either by uh, paper or using the internet voting system. Uh, and they have additional protections to prevent voter coercion in which you can vote multiple times and the latest vote is the one who, which counts. And you can also, uh, if you were coerced to vote online, you can also vote by paper after uh, the, the online voting is closed uh, to make sure that your, your vote is, is really uh, the way you intend to. Uh, but a security analysis of the Estonian voting system is not, um, was not very inspiring also to read, so it's triggered with problems. A recent example uh, was the Swiss experience. So the Swiss government did a hacking challenge in the last month where it opened the uh, source, code, source code of their voting system. They purchased this system from Saito, it's a Spanish company. And researchers could take a look at how security measures were implemented and they found all sorts of problems which would allow in, in the cases uh, uh, demonstrated so far, insiders to manipulate uh, individual votes or uh, a fraction of the votes, and, and still this would be undetected due to the problems of how the uh, commitment schemes and zero-knowledge proofs were, were implemented. Um, go read the details, it's, it's fairly interesting uh, research. So okay, internet voting also has all sorts of problems, so we may have to look for more alternatives. And if you remember the first slide, I told you that uh, we need both integrity and secrecy here, and blockchains from this session, you, can, you, you learn that they can provide you actually with storage for private data, encrypted data, that cannot be changed afterwards. So it, it seems this, these properties match what we expect from elections really well, so maybe blockchains are really what we were looking for. We are, we are into something here, so maybe blockchains can solve all problems with elections after all. Probably not, I have to say. Uh, sorry for being pessimistic. The limitations here are clear. Uh, blockchain voting, in the case that someone will cast an individual vote to be stored in the blockchain, basically implies internet voting. The natural interface to cast a vote on the blockchain, an individual vote in the blockchain, would be exactly uh, using some internet uh, service to do that. So all those risks, they just come back. And in some cases, they come back amplified. So uh, for the voter to verify that the system is behaving correctly, uh, this can be harder. Uh, this is still vulnerable to insiders because to use this interface before the vote is stored in the blockchain, we still need to, write, to, to run software developed by humans who could have malicious intentions. You still need to protect uh, the, the voters' computers from, from uh, malware and other problems. We still have the problem with nation state attackers. And there is the additional risk of everlasting security. So since all these, these uh, the encrypted votes will be stored in the blockchain essentially forever, what happens if after the election someone finds a way to recover critical information about those votes to try to break ballot secrecy? What if a key leaks uh, or, or something is discovered afterwards? So blockchains actually do not solve the most relevant problems with uh, electronic elections, but they may help in, in some way. So this is the basic workflow of any election. You, you start with a voting session where people will go to the polling place, uh, cast their votes either through paper ballots or voting machines equipped with paper records for transparency, uh, increased transparency. And at some point, uh, the voting session will end and you do a tally, a local tally of just that voting uh, session, right? So either code count votes by hand or software in the voting machine 
prints you a, a, a result of that polling place, and you can do a recount with paper to match that that electronic result is correct. So you have a local tally already done. And this result can be made public. In several countries, it's actually mandatory to make that result public. So now the problem is just transferring this public result um, to the central tabulator, which will basically collect all the partial results from all over the country, and then publish the global outcome, who, who gets to be elected on this. Preferably, this should be done in a way that the voters, political parties, and any other stakeholders in the election, which is the entire society, by the way, um, can check that partial results were transmitted correctly without manipulation. So blockchains may be very useful for transmitting those results uh, because they can store public information uh, essentially forever or as long as they are uh, being kept or maintained um, in a way that the voters and other parties can check that the partial results were transmitted correctly and you can do recounts and other uh, tasks, audits on the blockchain itself. We did a similar effort in 2014 when I was still living in Brazil. Um, without using a blockchain, of course. Uh, it was too early for that. But um, in 2014, we conducted a crowdsourced uh, uh, project in which we told voters to go to the polling places and stick to the very end and take pictures of the poll tapes with the partial results for those places and send them to an um, uh, internet service we, we deployed. So we collected all these pictures. We extracted information from all these pictures to match with the electronic records uh, published by the electoral authority three days after the election. And we managed to do this for 4.1% of the vote, which is quite significant for a country that as large as Brazil with 140 million voters. Um, and this at the time was done using a cloud-based service, but I don't see any technical uh, problem of running this in a blockchain platform. And it would make, actually make some things easier because it would be decentralized and, and easier to scale. So I think my main takeaway here is Elections are not a playground for your latest technology. Uh, if your country already has uh, functional and transparent elections that public will trust, uh, that they can be audited using paper ballots or voting machines with paper records, congratulations. You have sorted out the problem with elections. It's, it's, they are good enough already. Uh, and this is more important than ever. We have we see the world uh, uh, increasing political polarization, and many of the uh, populists being elected in several countries are just playing this card of saying that the elections are rigged, and you need really independently verifiable elections uh, so that our democracies um, become as robust as we envision them to be. So you can find some references of work we did before uh, in improving the security of voting systems, especially in Brazil, and I thank you for your attention. Thanks. radio show on the Radio 24-7 and it's a tech radio show and I have a colleague and we're a little bit like yin yang even though we're getting closer and closer together because he has a show Aulutl about surveillance and uh, data and all this stuff and he tells me all the time with voting there's only one thing that works analog he says it's the only secure way and he, it, it's a big sort of claim and, 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 and thing he he always talks about would you agree with this, with the uh, systems that you know of? Yes, so I would say it, it depends a little bit on the scale you're doing the election. Um, I, I claim that, well, any country in the world, should, it should be possible to do a decentralized, a transparent, paper-based election. Of course, this is easier in some countries than others. If your country is small, for example, with not that large uh, population or, or without too much heterogeneity in terms of, um, how can I say that? I'm trying to pick the nice words. Uh, so you, you have a, a, an average level of instruction that's, that's good enough. People understand how the system works, how they can inspect that the system is working. Um, I would say this is great for, for paper-based elections. This is a great setting. For other countries in which this is not true, in Brazil, for, for example, you have the problem that uh, someone will cast votes in the middle of the Amazon forest and you need to transport those at some point to the central government in the capital, right? How can you do this? How can you make sure that these votes will, these votes will still survive the trip uh, to be able to be audited and, and so on. So I, um, I would say that for small countries with stable democracies, it stick to paper ballots. For larger countries with problems in logistics uh, and level of instruction and inequality even, um, these are the places where you can perhaps experiment with, with other technologies as they have been doing in the past. Um, one thing I can add is electronic voting is not per itself insecure. It's just that efforts... Um, 
done in the past decades, decades in that direction were too isolated from the experts, were too usually conducted by governments which were not very democratic in the first place. And this, of course, leads to horrible outcomes, such as horrible, horribly insecure systems being used in practice. And what, what exactly is it that goes wrong if something goes wrong? So uh, you can break, for example, ballot secrecy. So in, in Brazil, I will, I will stick to uh, the evidence we collect from Brazil. You could actually, after the election, figure out how the Supreme Court uh, judge voted based on the public information. Uh, this was one of the main results we did in, on the Hacking Challenge organized in 2012. We never managed to do that, of course, because we would end up in jail, as an example. But the conditions, the technical conditions, were there and they are still there. And voter coercion, in particular, is extremely important in Brazil. It's a constitutional requirement there for the voting system to preserve uh, ballot secrecy. So it's one of the few ways where things can go horribly wrong. Uh, maybe you can, you can have an insider also uh, uh, manipulating the software so it's, it miscounts votes for certain candidates. So all of many things can go wrong um, for electronic elections not conducted properly or in, in the most transparent way. Uh, Brazil is quite advanced in fintech, as I remember. Um, the banking infrastructure, uh, it's, it's quite advanced because it had to survive uh, many fraud attempts along the years, yeah? <laughs> so does that mean that uh, Brazil is moving forward with blockchain or...? Um, so the government already has some official position for blockchains. Uh, so Bitcoin at least is considered a commodity there and you, you actually need to declare uh, if you own Bitcoin or at least if you got money out of Bitcoin transactions um, in your tax return. Uh, and, and so the government at least understands something and I know that the central bank has a, a, a special group understanding the technology and trying to think of regulation around it. Uh, but we don't see as much ado adoption on daily, uh, on daily life as, as in other countries like Switzerland, for example. So you may get so there. That was my next question. Which country is like a case country where they're, where they're doing most things around blockchain? I may not be the best person to respond to that uh, question, but it seems Switzerland is, is doing some things um, right in, in, in that way. Um, I see the example of Venezuela be coming up uh, from time to time, but of course this for very different reasons, right? If your financial system breaks down, maybe you, you still can use a blockchain or Bitcoin to do transactions, but these are, it's a different story. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.